Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews 499th episode. Today's guest is the former MLA for Dunvegan Central Peace Notley. He she is also to date the only Alberta NDP Minister of Energy in the province of Alberta. Please help me welcome Marg McQuaid Boyd. Sorry, the Honorable Marg McQuaid Boyd. Uh, Marg, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. So, Marg, I've got to start off with the question that I've asked every single politician who's come on the show. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, gosh. Um, I think I've always been involved. Our family, we're always community people. And uh, I uh, early days when I moved to Fairview, I met uh, Grant Notley, and he was um, you know, a pretty compelling uh, person. And I started working on some of his campaigns just at a real you know, putting up some signs, doing some phone calls thing and, um, you know, maintained a friendship with the Notleys. And so I was always involved politically up north and, you know, the opportunity came and uh, I felt like uh, we needed to have some representation from our uh, up up where I lived, uh, you know, in a different way. So I answered the challenge. So what what drew you to Ottawa, uh, to politics, I should say, not Ottawa, but what drew you to politics? Because you can give back in many different ways through volunteerism, through nonprofits, but you chose the political route. What was it about giving back and that better representation that you wanted that really drove home that you wanted to put your name on the ballot? Um, yeah, I guess a, a couple of things. I was always a social studies teacher along with other other subjects and so I've always been politically interested in the world and uh, I guess as a teacher I saw some of the things that were going on in the education industry or you know sector that I didn't really like too much uh, certainly healthcare was always an issue for me uh, my mom was a nurse so I always watched what was going on and and getting better health care up in the r rural areas was important um, so those are probably two of the issues that brought me to wanting to do something and to be honest I was kind of whining one day about the election coming and I said you know nothing will ever change and my husband said well why don't you run and uh, I thought you know I our kids are grown I I can I can actually do that and so and I wasn't teaching any longer and I was semi-retired at the time so I thought yeah if you're going to complain put your name in and see if you can make a difference now, correct me if I'm wrong. This was not your uh, 2015 was not the first election that you contested, correct? Correct. Yeah, I ran in 97. Um, honestly, just to keep the NDP name on the ballot, uh, we had a, a an incumbent at the time. And uh, but, you know, it was a really good experience. I, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, and actually, that was probably the time when I really found a passion for running uh you know going to forums uh meeting people on the doors and uh, even though i knew i didn't have a strong chance at that time to run or to win um i i did develop a passion and it does kind of get in your blood and i knew i had a, a good chance in 2015 and being a bit of a competitive person i thought okay i'll take another run at it and see what i can do so I want to talk about that first election campaign, because you, you're openly honest when you said that you didn't expect to win, but you always remember your first campaign. You always remember the first time you see your name on the ballot. You always remember the first time you see your name on a sign. What was that experience like for you to see your name on the ballot and know for a fact you've at least got one vote under your belt? <laughs> yeah you know it was it was interesting and and they do say at some point you will believe you're going to win and they were right I, at some point I, you know maybe I could take this and maybe I could I could I would be in Edmonton and then I'd think oh what 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 if because I had children at home still and and that or they were teenagers but you know it does impact but that happened and yeah seeing your name on a ballot is kind of surreal and I think one of the other things that I didn't expect to see was how polarized sometimes uh, elections can be that people who were my friends suddenly were distancing themselves a bit with me when I, you know, you put your beliefs out in public and it changes some of your relationships. I mean, they went back afterwards, but uh, I didn't expect that. I, and I remember at one point, um, one person came up and said, well, we have a liberal candidate now who's a man 
um, you should probably drop out, <laughs> you know, because they didn't want me to split the vote. I, I wasn't expecting that either. And, uh, and, and one of the times I was at a forum and, and somebody came up and said, you know, you're a really great candidate. I would love to vote for you, but you're a woman. And I was not expecting to hear that. Uh, that was in 97. Um, you know, they weren't a, an, a natural NDP, but they thought I would be a good candidate. But I that was the first time I thought, well, why should that matter? But it was what it was. You, you talk about polarization. And I want to I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but we'll talk about it now. Did you see a change in the polarization from uh, the 97 election to the 2015 and even the 2019 election? I, I sure did. Um, not as in 2015, I think, um, honestly, the NDP maybe caught people by surprise and they didn't see us as a viable um, winner. And um, I think it towards the end, it, it got a little bit rougher. But, you know, when I look, we had maybe several signs damaged and uh, not any, I can't remember any threats or things like that, but certainly in 2019, um, it was it was actually scary at times. Some of the... Um, the threatening behavior, you know, the damaging of signs, um, you know, they, uh, I guess it's, it was a sign that they took us as we could win, you know, and, um, and we, we it, it felt uh, a little more scary in 2019 than it did in 2015, for sure. <laughs> um, I want, I want to turn to the 2015 election, because this is the election that the NDP going into it, weren't doing well in the polls, but by the end of it, you won a majority government. Up in Dunvegan, Central Peace Notley, what was the moment you noticed that the 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 ground was changing for the NDP, particularly for yourself, or was it from day one? Um, it wasn't from day one. Although, like I said, I I felt I had a good chance. Um, the former MLA for there was retiring, so it was a fair game. They had a new uh, who, that was who? Hector Goudreau. Hector, yeah, okay. Yeah, and um, so they had a new person running. Uh, the Wild Rose had somebody who had run before, and and then myself. And uh, when I first entered the contest, um, there was just me and the Conservatives. And I had a Conservative friend phone me one day, and he said, uh, the Wild Rose just declared a candidate. He said, you could come up the middle just like stuff. <laughs> and I, I laughed at the time. Um, but I, I got thinking, you know, it, it's going to be an even fight uh, as far as a choice. And um, so I, I will be honest, we counted a bit on vote splitting between the two conservative parties. But there was probably, a, you know, maybe two weeks in, I started seeing a shift and, and there was an elderly lady in town that dropped in and she'd gotten in her car and she went around counting signs. And she, she came and reported how many signs she found. And we had more signs than anybody in Fairview. But I did feel a, a shift in momentum. And I thought, you know, I think I think we can do this. And then we really put a push on. And about a week before the election, Rachel came up and um, she pulled me aside after. And she said, you know, we think you're going to win, but keep running like you're not. You know, it's good advice, you know, just... Um, the polling was saying we were, and you know, it was a close race, but um, I, I felt a week in that I think we're going to pull this off. And uh, But then the night came when I saw my name across the screen, I had to see it twice because I didn't believe it. You know, it was a bit surreal. So I, I, I gotta I throw I'm gonna throw a little shade at your campaign here because in 2015 I was the campaign manager for Danielle Larvey, and we I wanted know. Rachel Notley to come into our riding, but no, she came to Cent uh, Dunvegan Central Peace Notley, of course, home oh. of hers. So we we always held that against you in our campaign for the last few days, but I want to oh, turn. I did not. <laughs> I want to turn to that. Hey, she, Danielle won. We ran a great campaign. You and her and Debbie Jabor did an amazing job representing the Northern, Northern Alberta in caucus. But I want to turn to election night because you just said you had to look twice when you realized that you were elected. How much yeah. of a, like weight then gets put on your shoulders because you're new in government. You're a new MLA. 
the province had never voted NDP in their life before. And now besides your riding outside of Edmonton or Calgary. So how much of a responsibility did you put on yourself to say, okay, this is now real. And the life that I once knew is now gone. And politician Mark McQuaid Boyd is now here. Yeah. I don't think it struck me for the first couple of days. I honestly, the next day I we had a party that night and uh you know everybody was super happy the next day I had to go clean out my constituency office and I was getting lots of phone calls and and emails and it was hard to handle all that at the time but you know we things had to happen we had to get things disconnected and cleaned out and everything probably a day or two into that though it started just strike me that uh, yeah this is this is going to be different even the volume of emails getting and messages I was getting and then Rachel had said when she was up uh, when Marg wins I have a cabinet position for her and then I thought oh I forgot about that part and I wonder what that'll be and so uh, a few days in she did contact me and asked me to come and then we discussed uh, you know a cabinet position and you have to as you know go through some hoops to be vetted in that but she told me um, we were actually en route and I'll never forget this we were at the Onaway corner on highway 43 Dan was driving my husband and we were heading to Edmonton to meet Rachel and and I assumed that's when she would tell me so uh, she called and I said uh, just so you know my husband's we're on speakerphone and my husband's listening <laughs> and she just said um and then so that's when she told me I was going to be minister of energy and uh honestly I had looked at you know maybe education because I was a teacher or maybe advanced ed or agriculture because we were farmers um et- energy wasn't on my radar particularly and when I heard though I was very honored because we have a lot of energy people in my family but at the same time that was probably my oh my god moment that's a huge responsibility and uh that's probably the day or the time when it struck me that yeah life is really going to change for me so i've I've asked this question to many people who've been appointed to cabinet and i want to get your perspective do you run in that election thinking you're going to be appointed to cabinet or do you run in that election because you want to change the voice at your constituents level because I've heard people say I I run for politics because I guarantee I'm guaranteed a uh, cabinet position and that's what I want. And then I hear people say, you know what? Even if I wasn't appointed, I would still be honored to serve as a backbencher in a caucus. For you, what was it? Was it you ran because you believed in the betterment of your community and a cabinet position was just a second nature? Like, okay, if I get it, I get it. It doesn't matter if I don't, though. Yeah, honestly, that the second I, I ran just to represent my region and see, you know, if we could, I could represent rural Alberta, um, you know, and the concerns and just serve my community. Honestly, until Rachel brought it up uh, a week before when she mentioned that in her speech, it was not even on my radar. I never even thought about a cabinet position. I totally was planning to be an MLA. And so it did change what I had hoped to do because of course when you're a minister you can't spend as much time in your writing as you you wish. As Minister of Energy you're the salesperson of the energy industry in the province so you're not in your writing compared to other cabinet ministers. No no I spent a lot of time in Calgary for sure but at the same time uh, a lot of the resource it was in my constituency and in Grand Prairie. So I became a bit of a, a minister of the North to Grand Prairie to help them with some of their concerns. Uh, and because a lot of them were energy concerns. So if it wasn't energy, it was usually related. So it, it was still a good fit. But you're right. I, I spent a lot of time in Calgary, met many flights from Grand Prairie to Calgary. In your four years in office as Minister of Energy and MLA for Dunvegan Central Peace Notley, what was the most challenging aspect of the job, in your opinion? Uh, probably like even just being an MLA or, you know, a public official, you know, trying to please everyone because you, you soon learn you're not going to and uh, balance the concerns of your Uh, constituency with you know the direction the province is going and uh, trying to balance that time you know devote good time as minister to your stakeholders 
and develop that policy, but also time with your constituents. And then there's your your personal life, trying to <laughs> spend some time with your family and friends, which is important as well. So, you know, there's there's some challenges there for sure. And, you know, sometimes trying to explain to people the direction we're going is this, but it doesn't mean that it's going to hurt this region. This is what it means. And there's just never enough time to explain to everybody what the direction means and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Now, I, I don't want to speak out of turn when I ask this question, but I'm going to ask it in a, the most appropriate way that I can. You are the Minister of Energy for the first Alberta NDP government in the province of Alberta. You have a target on your back because people look at the NDP and they don't see a uh, a friendly government when it comes to energy. But you look at your record and you can go back and you can say you've moved the energy file forward. How much of a target did you find yourself in when in that position, because I can imagine you're getting attacked left, right, and center. You're getting attacked by the opposition parties, for, and then you're getting attacked by the sort of the more left side of the political spectrum who think that you're not going far enough to transition. How much of a target did you find yourself in in those four years as Minister of Energy? Um, I don't know that I felt I was a target, but certainly there was a lot of... Um fear I would say when we first came in I would meet with people and I always asked three questions you know I would well I would do three things I would tell them about my background you know like I I'm very familiar with the industry although I thought at the time I was but there's lots to know you know I had family in the industry um that I was here to listen and and so every time I met with a stakeholder I just say tell me about your business um tell me what your biggest challenges are and tell me how I can work with you. And so the more I did that, we called it kind of the charm offensive at first. We just went down to Calgary and I spent hours meeting with everybody. And I think as they realized I was there to listen, I wasn't the enemy, we were there to help. Um, I think that helped. Uh, that was in Calgary. I think I, I was able to, you know, um, make, make people aware that we were we were there to work with them and once we announced the royalty review panel and a few things like that i think there was a little less angst and i'm, I'm really proud of the royalty review we did and and the outcome and i think uh, so was the industry because we really included them i think when i was up north there was more angst and they didn't always get the message that i was working with the industry and so i felt probably a little more targeted up in my own writing and up in the northwest um because there was a fear. I mean, there's for 44 years, they had the same sort of government. And so we were new and they were afraid. But, you know, now I, I meet up with former stakeholders and they're all, many of them are still quite civilized to me and friendly and have included me in some some meetings and things, um, you know. And and so I think there's not as much fear this time if, if an NDP government does come in again because they know us from before but they just didn't know us and so i think it was more fear than target but yeah certainly you're right it, it's uh and then when you speak about the left i think i certainly was accused of being in the pockets of big industry by some left wingers um in early days so i think you know i needed to articulate to them no and honestly when you're elected you you work for everybody you don't just work for the left wing or the right wing you work for everybody so you've got to find that balance of 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 needs and and um ways you can help what's the one thing as minister of energy you wish you would have been able to push a little bit further on what file or was there a moment that you said you know what i wish i could do that again because i think this is a budding area in the energy industry in alberta that needs to be talked about and it's not being talked about yeah um as i said i was really proud of the royalty review we did and we did um you know a paper in diversification a study in diversification how we could use our energy and other ways to bring value to alberta and we did a study in gas and how we could bring that forward we got as far as the ideas we didn't get as far as the implementation but the one thing that probably i wish we would have had more time and resources to work on and we just ran out of runway because of the election cycle was uh, the liability file you know in uh oil and you know the orphan wells and the 
abandoned infrastructure. We did a lot of good work with industry and in looking where the, identifying the problem and what are some of the solutions, but we absolutely ran out of runway to do it. And um, so the work has been done. It's there and, um, you know, the current government has it if they wish to, to work with it. And, but that's a file that needs attention regardless of who's uh, victorious in the next election is it's a growing issue in Alberta and maybe working more with the tax situation. It wasn't in my ministry, but it was with the municipalities and companies not paying their fair share of taxes in some cases. Again, it was work we were starting, but we just didn't come up with a solution before the election time. I, I like the fact that you just mentioned that because the Red Deer County has just posted that they are millions of dollars short this year because of property taxes not being able to be collected by oil and gas industry, even though the oil and gas industry has, quote unquote, rebounded. Um, is that the issue that uh, energy companies are facing this year and going forward into the future is they might be getting a windfall from the sale of it, but they're not paying their taxes. So really yeah. are, are, is there a balance that needs to be stricken by the oil and gas industry companies to say, okay, we need to pay our bills, but also we need to also expect that our boom and bust cycle is not going away anytime soon. Yeah. And to be clear, most companies are paying their fair share. It's, it's That's a true. few actors. And I think there is an understanding in the industry that, that it needs to be dealt with because it's painting them all with a negative brush and, and many are doing the right thing and paying their taxes. Um, I know it's an issue with the municipalities. I understand in the last, um, I don't know whether they're called RMC or something now, they've changed their name since I was there, but they that came up as a, a huge issue for municipalities. So it's an issue for the, gov the current government and I believe they're looking at it um, you know, it, it, it started out when times were tough for, for some of the companies, but at the end of the day, you know, if you and I don't pay our rent or pay our taxes, uh, there are consequences. So I think, um, I would hope that this current government is working with it. And I believe they probably are because it's a huge issue. And, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't an easy issue. And that's partly why we ran out of runway at the time too, is it wasn't an easy thing to tackle. You you had the pleasure to serve alongside uh, Premier Rachel Notley, now leader of the official opposition, uh, Rachel Notley. Uh, you, you, a first-term Minister of Energy, her first-term uh, Premier. What was the relationship like between you and Rachel when it came to the energy industry? Because, uh, again just talking off the hand uh, people might know that my husband is ricardo miranda former minister of tourism culture under rachel notley as well so he hasn't told me anything but i want to know was she hands-on <laughs> was she talking to you what were there weekly meetings to say okay this is what's happening in the ender energy industry what was it like to work in her government um uh, actually it was great i've, I've known rachel probably since she was about her grow up in Fairview um, and I knew she was bright but I had no idea how bright she was till I was in government with her and uh, she knew my files as well or better than I did she she was always up on them and we met very regularly um, and I learned early on that I better know my files better than her because um, I went in once kind of making the assumption that I could just explain to her a, a couple things and I was wrong she <laughs> she basically made sure I knew my files a little better than I did. Um, I think that was true for all the files. Like she was, she would spend hours reading voraciously, and and she was up to speed on a lot of things. And and as you know, our chiefs of staff spend time with her chief of staff and getting her up to file up to speed. But um, no, she was great. Uh, I wouldn't say she was hands on, but she certainly worked with us, and she knew she was hands on in that she knew what the files were and what the issues were. But um, is there a is there was there a misconception about Rachel Premier Notley uh, during your time in office when it came to the energy industry and even yourself that we need to dispel right here right now? I think maybe uh, you know I I think certainly she had her more favorite files you know on social issues and childcare and poverty and those kind of things, but 
as she said in many of her speeches, and I said too, we were there to govern for everybody. And, and we all know how important the energy industry is to Albertans. And uh, you can't not spend time on that file, those files, um, because uh, one of the bread, one of the breads and butters, I guess it's not the, the one, but um, you know, of Alberta, it's a backbone of Alberta. And so you do need to spend time. Um, she, she was very good at listening to what my perceptions were, or my suggestions were uh, very collaborative that way. So, but I wouldn't say, I know there are a lot of people still think she hates oil and gas and that's not the truth at all. She, she has a good understanding of the industry and um you know, and its role in Alberta. And, and I, I see some of the things they're coming up with for, you know, the future and some of the ideas. And I think she has a good idea of the clean technology available and supporting the industry. And yeah, so I think it was a misconception. I don't know how you get around it. I've told people so many times and it just, they don't seem to believe me, but it's, it's, uh, she certainly was a supporter of the industry. You served as Minister of Energy and MLA for four years from 2015 to 2019. What is the one thing you wish you knew then that you know now about both the Ministry of Energy job, but also your role as MLA that you could say, I wish I knew this so that way it could help me a lot better in the future? Oh, that's hard to say. Yeah, you kind of just, uh, it was kind of MLA minister by immersion. Um, I thought I knew lots about how good government uh, but learn the job and um i don't know I, I i think i had a good grasp of things when i went in i certainly didn't know as much of how a ministry works so that would something but i don't know how you'd know without living through it so you know it's um but um uh, yeah i think other than trying to balance my time or clone myself sometimes that uh, it was so, you know, it was a bit of trial by fire at first, but yeah, I know I'm not sure how I'd answer that. <laughs> I want to turn to the 2019 election. Um, you <laughs> decided to put your name forward to stand for re-election in the new riding of, uh, I'm gonna, I, I don't even know yeah, the Central, new, <laughs> Central Peace Notley. Um, was it an easy decision to say, okay, I, I, I want another term at this? Or was it a back and forth because some of your colleagues left, some of them stayed? Was it easy for you to stand for re-election? Oh, absolutely. I wanted to do another four years just to try to accomplish some of the things that we didn't get done in the first four years. Um, I knew it would be tough because I was running against another incumbent um, and putting those two writings together wasn't going to be favorable for us. I knew that, but I still wanted to give it a shot and uh, do do what I could. Um, didn't turn out the way we had wished, but uh, yeah, it was an easy decision. I absolutely wanted to do the job some more. Was the transition back to private life easy for you? Because I've talked to many politicians on the uh, progressive conservative side who said, after 12 years or four years or six years in office, and then the next day, not getting those calls, not getting those emails was a big challenge. Um, it was, uh, you know, you you one day you're, you're in this job and you're, you're go, go, go. And then suddenly you're not. And um, I have to say, there's really not much, help for you after you finish you just you have to go clean out your office and hand in your keys and then you're done and and life carries on and uh so I found it a little hard um it's kind of like being fired I think <laughs> you got fired by the by the voters I guess you know and and just there wasn't much for support uh, anywhere so thankfully I'd maintained my connections with my friends and uh, you know family and that so I mean it's you know, it, it's tough. Yeah, you, you go through sort of being relevant and it feels like you're not relevant for a bit and you have to just find your way. Uh, I don't know if that's a good way to. Yeah, you know, it, it was tough for a while, but, um, you know, we spent some time thinking about, you know, where to go next and, and you sleep for the first month after <laughs> Because you're so tired. So you're not. But, I, my husband was not the only one who slept for a month. after. <laughs> oh, at <laughs> at least I was so exhausted. And so you don't really have as much, I mean, you have some time to think about it, but you're just so tired. And, um, 
but I, I won't lie. It was, it was quite tough to, to go from being so busy to not being busy, but you know, you do. And uh, we now we have a, there is an organization of former MLAs and we've talked about that. Uh, and I, I'm on the executive for that as a, a director um, about that's an organization that maybe could be a little more helpful to people when they're done in transition because it's not so much the financial or anything else it's just more the for me it was the psychological like what now because I was putting all my efforts into continuing and so what do you do next and yeah it's it's not an easy time how's life post politics do you miss it is there still an itch to get back into the political realm or is it is it is the uh, the political bug out of Mark McQuaid Boyd's body the honorable Mark McQuaid Boyd's body <laughs> I don't know if it'll ever be out. I, I still have the itch for sure. Um, people have asked if I'm running the next election. I said, you know, if I was 10 years younger, I would um, try. But I think um, it, you know, it's time to, I won't be in that role, but I, I certainly look for ways to, to be involved, perhaps like this former MLA uh, group. Um, I'm doing a little bit of uh, public affairs work now. I'm part time with Council Public Affairs. So that keeps me involved politically in the whole picture in Canada and Alberta. And I find that quite interesting. So, you know, there's ways to be political and involved without being a, a candidate. And I would say I'm in that category now. Do you still get recognized? Because I always find it hard when I'm out with my husband and he always gets recognized. Oh, oh you're the former MLA or you're this, that or the other. And they always ask, are you running? Is it, it because you seem like a down to earth woman and I apologize for saying that, but you seem like someone who does didn't let the job get to her head. You kind of did your job that you were entitled and you left afterwards. Does it still get to you when people say, oh, you were the former minister of energy? Yeah, I see. I see a few people once. I mean, kind of yeah, um, I think uh, I'm recognized there. Not sure I'm right. I live in Edmonton now. I'm not sure people recognize me totally here. And of course, I was in rural Alberta, so everybody knows everybody. So that was kind of a different situation. But yeah, every once in a while. In fact, when we were in Cancun <laughs> recently at, at Christmas, just after Christmas, there was somebody sitting beside us you know, in the sun chairs there, and uh, they were from Calgary, and I think they were in oil and gas just by the conversation. I saw the one guy, he kept kind of looking at me, and I think because I was out of context, he wasn't sure who I was, but it happens every once in a while, people see me, but yeah, and then I go, I, as I say, I'm involved with a few stakeholders still, so, you know, they ask, uh, but I think it's it's kind of run its course. I don't think I get recognized as much as I did in earlier days. I'll still recognize you, Marg. Um yeah. <laughs> I want to, oh, there's a lot of new NDP candidates who are putting their name for it for the very first time in this upcoming election. What advice would you give them going into this campaign? Because we're in that red zone where the campaign is going to be a few months from now, and this is when you got involved. What advice would you give them? I would say if they can try to find a mentor who's been in the job. I know they do have, you know, I think some of the current they're trying to help but they're going to be busy too so I certainly have put my name in to a couple people if you ever want to chat give me a call or talk you through things because I think that's helpful and um, when if they get elected uh, I think it's important to find somebody to chat with and hopefully there's some of us who have been in the job before can fill that role to help out um, you know, for the for the job, because it is a big job and it's a big change. And uh, I remember Rachel first day saying to us, don't forget your family and friends, because at the end of the day, that's who's waiting for you when you're done. And uh, and it's easy to get lost in that sometimes. And I think just to be reminded that you have a family, you have a friend. I had a, I have a good friend in Grand Prairie. And she said when I told her that she said, so you need somebody to make you pour your own wine and carry your own golf clubs and I said absolutely and you need to be that person for me and she still jokes about that but oh. you know it's it's important to have some of those things um pointed out to you because you can get caught up in it and and you know if you run and you don't win it's good to have somebody to talk to after about it to debrief and sometimes you you need that outside person to to listen to Marg, this has been a fantastic conversation, and I want to end on this last question. 
you have been at the height of political power here in Alberta. You have been uh, the Minister of Energy. You have been the MLA for four years. Looking back on it, would you do it all over again? In a heartbeat. I absolutely would. It's uh, it's such a privilege to serve and be an MLA. Um, I had no idea about that until... I was there, and it's it's a huge privilege to to be a minister and and serve Albertans and and represent Alberta to the world, literally. Um, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't trade that. It was it was like getting another master's degree or a PhD in in the learning, and uh, and it, it was a true honor. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. Well, Marg, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me for the last 40 minutes and talking about this. This has been an honor to talk to you about your career, about politics, but also about just yourself, because we don't do that often enough. And we always bitch and complain, pardon my French, (laughs) on uh, social media. So we need to have these conversations. So thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you, Chris. This is a pleasure to be on your program and talk to you and reconnect. It is. So with that, I want to remind everyone, as I just said, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been episode 499 of the Cross Border Interviews. We will be back tomorrow with episode 500. Talk to you then.